Denver District Attorney Beth McCann and her guests are here today to discuss the collection of crime intelligence data, including the work of the Crime Gun Intelligence Center and the Denver Crime Lab, on this edition of Dialogue Denver DA. The Denver District Attorney is a state of Colorado office elected by Denver voters. The two primary goals of the Denver District Attorney are prosecuting criminals to the fullest extent possible and protecting the rights and interests of innocent victims. I don't have any records that account anymore. Let me refer you to someone who can help. I've got him on the line. Thank you. You can't keep up with me. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Case closed. Hello everyone, I'm Tamara Banks and welcome to the show. Let's welcome Denver District Attorney Beth McCann and Gregory LaBerge, Director of the Denver Crime Lab. Also joining us is Assistant District Attorney Ryan Brackley and Chief Deputy District Attorney Steve Abraham. Everyone, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So Beth, my, my first question I want to ask to you to sort of set the tone is, um, of course, the DA's office is supposed to prosecute criminals, right? So we all know that. But what happens between the time the crime is committed and you file charges? In other words, how do you determine what charges to, to file? So there has to be an investigation. Um, we have to collect facts from witnesses. We collect evidence, um, often send evidence to the crime lab for testing. Uh, and then we compile, we take a look at all of that data and take a look at our statutes and see what crime might have been committed, if any, and what level of crime to charge. But um, we, we won't charge a crime unless we believe that we have enough evidence that a jury could reasonably find someone guilty of that crime beyond a reasonable doubt. So our investigation is really critical. Right. So that's why we have these experts here with us today to talk a little bit more about how we gather that information. So the investigation of a crime and the collection of that crime intelligence data depends on the collection of the information from a variety of sources. So Gregory, tell us about the, the crime lab and the role it plays in investigations. The crime lab has several units. Um, really, when an investigation begins, the first unit to respond is the crime scene unit. So we have to establish, uh, A, what is the crime scene, uh, the size of the crime scene, and, and what is involved in that crime scene. So pretty much anything can be evidence. It just depends on the case we're investigating. So we work with detectives initially to process the crime scene, identify evidence, package and preserve it, and then store it in the property bureau until we do analysis. After that, we talk to the detectives and have an interview, sometimes very formal, sometimes informal, where we sit and discuss with them the nature of the case. What are we investigating? What's alleged to have happened? And what evidence and testing can uh, be done to help to resolve that, to answer specific questions in an investigation? Once that's established, we do a request. They'll request our services. And then we have processes in the crime lab to go through and to test that evidence and derive the results and get the reports back to the detectives in a timely manner. So that's in general, a very general approach. Um, we also have a lot of specialties. We have DNA, chemistry, uh, arson investigations, uh, latent print analysis. Uh, we have uh, forensic video analysis called the Forensic Imaging Unit that looks through video and can get still images. We have many technologies that we employ to do this on a daily basis. So I imagine the relationship between the crime lab and the district attorney's office is pretty important in order to, to solve crime. So Ryan and Steve, can you build a little bit more about what that relationship looks like and how that works? So we'll often start working with the lab um, at a crime scene. The DA expects um, her deputy DAs and chiefs to go out on homicide cases so that we're there available to answer questions, consult, and just basically be there to be part of the team. So oftentimes we'll start interacting with Greg's folks at, at a crime scene. Um, sometimes we'll be asked about the importance of certain pieces of evidence or about collection methods, um, basically advising the detectives and the lab as they start working together on a case. 
as we get deeper into a case and we get to that charging stage, oftentimes we'll ask the lab to, to test particular pieces of evidence if we need particular questions answered. For instance, if there's a, a gun found at a scene and we can't, we don't have a witness as to who put that gun at the scene, we might ask for fingerprints or DNA testing. If there are ballistic evidence, bullet shells or bullets at a scene, we'll ask the lab to analyze those so we can try to compare them to each other or perhaps a known gun. So we will look at the evidence that's collected at a scene or the evidence at a scene and we'll start working with detectives in the lab to decide what's most appropriate to test. Um, the lab asks us or tells us we can't test everything. So we work together to define what's most important. And sometimes that changes. And, and Steve, uh, as the chief assistant DA, what is your role then in, in bringing this all together? So I am assigned to a courtroom uh, with a staff of attorneys and investigator and a victim advocate. And so our work with the crime lab is often after that initial investigation and the filing of charges as the case moves through the court system. So as the case is assigned an attorney or attorneys, um, they continue any follow-up investigation. Sometimes we do interviews with witnesses or re-interview witnesses. Uh, we learn new things about the case and then we'll take a look at testing that's been done at the lab already and see if that's sufficient or if the case is proceeding to trial, if we need to do some additional follow-up work. Um, on a drug case, for instance, that might be going to trial, we have to confirm the results of the presumptive testing. Um, on initial DNA testing, we'll have to follow up to see um, uh, if there are other witnesses or individuals who are present at the crime scene. Then sometimes we have to file motions to get their comparative swabs, resubmit that to the lab. So by the time a case gets to me or people in the office like me, um, we're doing sort of the last bits of testing or working with the lab to figure out how we wrap a case up as best we can prior to a trial date if it's expected in a case. It's so much more involved than what we see on TV, right, with CSI right. Miami and CSI it's, New Orleans, right? Right. It doesn't happen over a commercial break. It happens over <laughs> a period of months usually. A lot of people. Um, right. It's not usually two people that do it all. It's usually 20 or 30. Right. All, all told. So tell me about the, is it the gun uh, Crime Gun Intelligence Center, what, what is that? Crime Gun Intelligence Center is a concept that we actually founded in late 2012 uh, in collaboration with ATF and DPD Investigations and the Denver DA's office. It was a collaborative project. And, and most things you'll find around Denver and Colorado are highly collaborative. That's one of the great things about living here. So we, we put together a, a concept, basically, we had learned a lot of lessons from doing cold cases with DNA. And we'd been doing cold cases since about 1999. I learned a lot of lessons about how to do testing and how to proceed down with the district attorney's office and detectives to prosecute those cases. Mm -hmm. And so there were a lot of lessons learned that really weren't being applied to the world of firearms. Hmm. Um, we had a, a database called NIBIN, which is the National Integrated Ballistic Information uh, Network that we had been using since the 1990s. And we were always very proactive with it, but we were finding that the investigations weren't being impacted, we felt, the way they should be. Uh, so we just really applied the lessons from the DNA world over to the firearms world. And with ATF, we created this idea of, of having more timely results coming off of the firearms database. And then following up in an aggressive way to try to figure out if cases were linked together, if there's a common shooter. If there's, so you might have five cases linked together by shell casings being found. Mm -hmm. And that's what the database does, is it links cases together based on an image of the breach face of the shell casing. Oh, wow. And so that image has a unique character. It's like a surface mm -hmm. from the firing pin hitting the back of the shell casing in the firearm, and then that shell casing being ejected. We find them all over the streets. And so we take those, put them in the database, and then a computer compares them every day. So when that happens, we may get one, two, or sometimes up to 15, 20 cases that are linked together. Different events throughout the city over time are now linked together. But there are a lot of other information that comes with that. There's addresses, there's license plate numbers, there's witness statements, there could be video, all of these other things. Well, they weren't really being collated and put together well. So in 2012, we took a, a basically a look at that and decided 
A, we need more resources to do this, and that's where ATF came in and they provided us the resources, that is people, mm -hmm. to, to pull all of this together. And so we became a database, well, we were a database, but then we became an area where we would collate and put together a package of intelligence, and hence the t term Crime Gun Intelligence Center. And then that packet of information will go out to street officers in the intel unit and ATF agents to go and interview people and to basically find out more about the cases mm -hmm. and see if we could find out who the shooter was. And the important thing about that is that not everybody's a shooter. Right. People have, a lot of people have guns, but not everybody points the gun at someone else and pulls the trigger. And so we wanted to focus on those people that we called serial shooters. Mm -hmm. And today it's been highly successful. Um, so we founded it and then ATF adopted it, the Crime Gun Intelligence Center concept, as a national model now. And so m most major cities in the United States are now setting them up. We've had probably 15 to 20 visits from people all over the country. Huh. And we're all on committees and, and things through ATF and through Department of Justice to try to replicate the success in Denver and really the collaborative nature of the success. And interestingly, when we go to other cities, we don't find the same level of collaboration that you find here. Mm -hmm. There's walls between agencies or people don't get along because of history. And, right. and really that doesn't happen here. Um, our biggest partner in it also is the city of Aurora. So we, we brought in Aurora because of our border. Right. Our eastern border has a lot of activity along Colfax especially. And we wanted to be sure that Aurora was part of the team. Mm -hmm. So our first out of Denver uh, partner was Aurora. So it sounds like there's a way then to more efficiently and effectively prosecute crimes based on, so talk a little bit about how you use this information then to really, because how long did it used to take compared to now finding the information that you need to get the right person? So Greg's example of, of DNA and how we, we applied the principles of DNA to the Crime Gun Intelligence Center I think is a great one. Um, we used to solve serial sex assault cases by, by the DNA that was left behind by offenders and we were able to compare that DNA and, and, and link cases. Um, and we could do that across borders and across states because of the DNA database that the FBI holds. We weren't able to do that or we weren't doing that with, with ballistic evidence. So we were doing it with DNA since the late 90s. We just started in 2012 doing it with ballistic evidence, and we can basically compare um, bullets or shells left at crime scenes of shootings to other shootings in not only the Denver metro area, but in Aurora and, and, and other parts of Colorado as right other now. parts are joining into the region. Yeah, but in later this year, it'll be a national database. Wow, because... So the ATF has put a lot of effort into, they create a national clearinghouse or a national correlation center where they're turning it into a full national database for shell casing. So it'll be the first national database in the world. So once, this, once the scientists are finished comparing all this evidence, mm -hmm. they'll turn it over to the Denver Police Department, and in our case, to uh, folks like Steve, who work directly with Denver, mm -hmm. to then build cases. And they ask questions. How is this shooting similar to this shooting? Or what evidence is the same? Or was there a, was there a car in common at the two of them? Are the, are just different, the same witnesses or, or victims being interviewed. And they'll put all of these together and sometimes they're able to identify a shooter. Mm -hmm. um, Steve has been really successful in that. Yeah, tell us more about that, Steve. Sure, so um, when we first started um, working on these cases specifically in the DA's office, uh, the cases were coming in with this technology but they were kind of spread out. We've now got it centrally located with one prosecutor. And so what our office is doing is working closely with those investigators at the ATF, which is um, not only federal agents, but also uh, law enforcement detectives from the Denver Police Department. Mm -hmm. And what they are doing is using their respective resources to, to focus on these cases where we have serial shooters or a gun that is linked to multiple different criminal episodes. So we look at the shooting itself and and the nature of it and then the link between right. each crime. But then we try to overlook uh, or, or overlay other data. Um, it can be witness statements, suspect information, license plates, um, anything that you know good old detective work will get you. Um, but we can also use um, other avenues of technology to make those links as well. Cell tower data, um, phone records, um, in certain cases, fingerprints or DNA. 
So we pull all of this information together, a central database, and the other part of it is all of the investigators and the attorney working these cases are in the loop. So they know about their cases, and when they see these links in other cases, uh, the collaboration really makes a difference in pulling it together and getting a case to filing status. The second thing that we do from an attorney's perspective is work with the U.S. Attorney's Office mm -hmm. to determine whether uh, when we solve these types of cases, whether they would be best filed in state court through our office or in uh, United States District Court through the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, who is best able to prosecute that type of crime. There's so many moving parts around it, and we're going to take a, a quick break. We've got so much more to talk about. This is fascinating, really cool stuff. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Dialogue Denver DA. Back in a moment. everyone this is the part of the program where we talk about a legal term and today's legal term is habitual offender and the definition is a defendant who has been previously convicted two or more times of a class one or class two or a violent class three felony a habitual offender is subject to more severe sentencing the court must consider the prior convictions in determining the sentencing in a current case if a person is proven to be a habitual offender so it sounds like it's pretty straightforward. Well, yes and no. We, yeah. have, to, we have to actually prove the prior cases mm -hmm. to, um, to the court. So, and we make a decision whether or not to actually file a habitual criminal count. It's not an automatic oh, uh, so it filing. No, one, two, three, you're... there's discretion. Okay. So if we don't think the kinds of crimes, for example, if they are nonviolent, fairly minor crimes, even though they're felonies, mm -hmm. we're not going to file a habitual criminal. It's really more for the violent uh, kinds of crimes or people who just won't stop, right. you know, after seven or eight felonies. Gotcha. Okay, so back to the topic at hand. We were talking about the um, Crime Gun Intelligence Center, and I know you're working with a, an amazing team of people that are really setting the tone for the rest of the nation. Tell us more about that. So I just wanted to um, emphasize you know, Greg is rather modest. I think we are really at the cutting edge in many ways of this technology. And um, people come from all over the country to visit the crime lab here in Denver. Uh, we are really at the forefront. The other thing that he didn't mention, which I think is really impressive, is the speed with which the crime lab uh, analyzes these shell casings. You know, they'll come in the night before and they'll analyze them by the next day. Wow. which is amazing. I, I just, we just don't see that in other kinds of crimes, honestly. So it's, a, it's an amazing technology that, that we have here. That's one thing that we hear when we travel around is that that level of collaboration and cooperation in Denver is, is so much more than any other place in the country. We work well with our federal uh, partners. We work well with the lab and the Denver Police Department. There's just a lot of co collaboration and cooperation. You got to talk to each other. It's yeah. nice if you like each other too, <laughs> right? Yeah. And solving crimes. And know each other's lane. I think we respect each other's what each other's expertise mm -hmm. is. Um, and and again, the 24 to 48 hour turnaround is important. I think that, um, and and I, and I think it's important to mention that all brass, so all shell casings that find their way onto the streets of Denver goes into this database mm -hmm. within 24 to 48 hours. So if shots are fired, we have uh, ways of finding those shell casings. And when they're found, they're brought to the property bureau and every morning they go into that database. And it doesn't matter what crime type. It's not just focused on homicides or serious crimes. It can be very minor things like shooting at a stop sign or shooting into an uh, unoccupied vehicle. 
or we're still going to collect those shell casings and get them into the database because those minor crimes could help later to solve more major crimes if they're linked to them. That's right. You never know. And you never know. Um, so another tool I think you had talked about, Gregory, was the National uh, Integrated Ballistic Information Network. Right. What Niven. is Niven? Is yeah. <laughs> I just rolls off your tongue. I like Niven right. much better. Uh, talk a little bit more about what that is. So Niven uh, was really created back in the 1990s. Um, there were two competing systems way back, and Niven emerged as the the most the the most. Uh, evolved system at the time and what it is is an imaging system for looking at the the back of a shell casing so mm -hmm. when you take a bullet put it in a gun there's a primer there mm -hmm. and the firing pin from the gun hits that primer and causes the bullet to fly out the end of the gun and there's a shooting that shell casing in a semi-automatic firearm is ejected those shell casings are what we find and that imprint from the firing pin and from the shell casing being a soft metal hitting the back of the gun, the breech face when it's fired, leaves a characteristic pattern. That pattern is scanned by laser, by a system, and creates a 3D image. That wow. 3D image can be searched against other images in the database, and then we have thousands and thousands of them in the database. So that's how we link casings together. So there can be several, you could have several guns shooting at, a, at an individual crime scene. We'll be able to figure out how many guns were involved at the crime scene. We'll generally be able to figure out what kind of gun they were, and then we'll be able to link each of those shell casings to other cases if we find them in Denver, as well as recovered firearms that we test fire in our firing range, get the shell casing from the recovered, fire, recovered firearm and compare it in the database. So if we pull you over in a car and you have a gun hidden under the seat, that gun automatically gets test fired within 24 hours and that shell casing put into the database and compared to everything else that's in there. Wow. And so that could link maybe you driving the car with the gun to several other cases that are unsolved. And that's how the system works. That's pretty incredible. I want to bring our DAs in in just a second, but let me ask you about one more high-tech um, tool, which is the shot spotter. Not a cleaning product, but um, something <laughs> that... <laughs> well, it depends on how you depends, define cleaning. Like, that's right, that's right. Cleaning the streets. <laughs> um, shot spotter. So shot spotter was a natural kind of extension of what we were already doing with Niven. We've been doing that since the 1990s. Um, we evolved the Crime Gun Intelligence Center to follow up aggressively on cases that were linked. But what we were finding is there were a lot of gunshots going on that were never called in by the public. Either the public heard them and didn't call in, didn't hear them, or were scared to call them in. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we partnered with a company, and the company's name is ShotSpot. And what they do, they have acoustic devices that are set up throughout Denver, and they allow us to triangulate, or they do it for us, and there's a, an app on the phone, so to speak, that tells us exactly within a very short distance of where to find or where the shooting has occurred. Mm -hmm. And it uses sound triangulation. And it, it gives within a couple of minutes, within a minute or so even. Wow. When the, the shots are fired, a notification goes to the police department, and the police department dispatches officers in high priority to get to those areas to find, mm -hmm. to either find the people firing the guns, right. or to find the evidence of the gu those guns being fired, like the shell casings. So how valuable is that type of technology for you guys to be able to find perps? I mean, it's very valuable. Yeah. Because like Greg said, folks don't often call these things in. Yeah. And sometimes it is a minor use of a gun. Someone's shooting at a stop sign, but someone may shoot at a stop sign not really paying attention or caring about who's watching them shoot at that stop sign. So that minor crime might generate a lot more eyewitnesses than a murder in a, in a back alley using that same gun. So it's very important for the police to be able to get to those scenes immediately and, and, and just start talking to people. And also it helps the police focus on the right people and the right, right. people to be talking to rather than the old school days of kind of coming into a neighborhood and putting everybody up against a, a wall. This, this kind of data-driven intelligence helps the police focus on the right folks to be talking to. Right, in a much quicker time frame, right? right? right, right. One of the things I wanted to make sure we talk about, because I think we only have like two minutes left, is DNA, which is my, one of my favorite topics. And uh, the Denver um, Police Department, the Denver Crime Lab was the first, right, in the nation to sort of use this data to gather uh, information to <laughs> for familial, yeah, yeah, we yeah. were the first. Um, in 2008, we we actually came out of our cold case project. Also, we were 
we had a lot of great success initially with matches on the CODIS database, which mm -hmm. is the National DNA Data Bank. But there were probably we had about 55, 60% matches initially, but that means there's still 40, 45% that weren't matching. So what about those cases? And amongst those were some very serious cases. So the British, uh, I'd been over there in 2006. We were hosted in Britain, and we saw that they had a familial search program that was very fruitful. They were, they were doing some great things. And basically what it is is if you have a DNA profile that doesn't match anybody in the database, there is a way to go into the database and look for potential relatives. Mm -hmm. So when we looked into acquiring the software, they wanted almost a million dollars for the software. Wow. And so um, myself and an employee at the, at the Denver DA's office at the time, we sat down and in three months we created a piece of software in Microsoft Excel and it was really clunky and it worked, but it took a long time. So we evolved it from there mm -hmm. to create a program that would actually do it. And so we did that in 2008. And uh, from there, you've seen a lot of things happening around the nation about using DNA to detect family members and databases, including recently with ancestry-based Right, that's pretty amazing. Golden State Killer, for example. Oh my gosh, uh, a great serial piece of killer, seventies and eighties, right? Yeah, in California Bay Area, or oh, actually all up and down California. Right. right. We only have about 20, 30 seconds left, Beth. I'll just I'll leave you with the final word about sure. how this team really pulls together to solve crimes. So I'm extremely proud of the work that we do in conjunction with our partners um, to successfully prosecute particularly these gun cases. And, um, you know, I think we really want to focus on violent crime and we want to try to get more guns off the streets of Denver. So when we have the kind of crime lab work and crime scene technicians that we have here in Denver and then our my terrific staff that works so hard to put these cases in front of a jury, in front of a court, um, you know, that's really satisfying in terms of public safety. And um, I think we are, citizens of Denver are very lucky to live in the city in terms of the ability to uh, solve these crimes and work together to really bring people to justice. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here for today's really fascinating discussion uh, about high-tech tools and advancements in the collection of crime intelligence to solve and prosecute crimes. I'm Tamara Banks. We'll see you next time.